good evening, everyone. It's great to see you back here. And um, tonight is our fourth lecture in the New Testament as we journey through the New Testament together. Tonight I want to share with you some thoughts, brief uh, devotional thoughts from the uh, first chapter of the book, the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul goes on after introducing himself, and we've seen the letter writing format last week, uh, who he is and to whom he's writing and bringing greetings. And then he goes on to really what is the gist of this letter. And he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I want to challenge you to at some point in time read through chapter 1 verses uh, 1 to or 3 to 14 and to do it slowly and to try and focus on every single word and every concept. Paul actually writes uh, in the Greek one long sentence and the one thought in his mind gives rise to the next thought and to the next thought. Um, it's, it really is a, it's a wonderful chapter. It is absolutely loaded with a message, every single word just about, uh, explains something about our relationship with God, who Jesus Christ is and how we relate to Him. Just listen again to verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father. That's God, and for the Jew this would be God, the one that they know, the only God. Uh, we call Him God the Father, and we know that He revealed Himself in three persons. And so He says, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can meditate on every one of those words, for example. The word Lord has significance when we think about our relationship with Him. He is a Lord. He is our Lord. He is, um, he is the boss, um, and we should relate to Him like that. The word Jesus is related to the word salvation. And so in, in Jesus Christ, we have salvation. The word Christ is um, the, another form for Messiah or the Anointed One. So in the title, even in the title of Jesus, we find so much that we can contemplate and, and think about. Now, this God and Father has blessed us in the heavenly realms. And again, you let your mind go just for a little bit. What, what does that really mean? We're not talking about earthly material blessings as such. As much as we refer to the things that we have, I'm blessed to have clothing. I, I was blessed today, I had three meals. As much as those things are blessings, this is not essentially what Paul is talking about in this particular passage. He's talking about blessings that are of a he heavenly uh, origin. He's blessed us in the heavenly realms. He's blessed us in the spiritual realm, if you wish. Uh, these blessings go way beyond our definition in terms of our material world kind of blessings. He says... And, and these blessings um, we have in Christ. Now, as you then continue, and I'm not going to read the whole passage, but as you continue, you will find the words in Christ, with Christ, focusing on Jesus Christ. This is the way that the blessings have come to us. If it wasn't for Jesus Christ, we wouldn't have had all of those spiritual blessings. In, in my opinion, as I go through the chapter, and I've, I've preached through this um, several sermons, just going slowly through uh, chapter 1, verses one, 3 to 14, I believe from that point on in verse 4, Paul actually starts almost enumerating, listing those different blessings. The first one he mentions, because he's just now talked about these spiritual blessings. The first one he says, For he, God, chose us, in Him, in Jesus Christ. When you look at the Greek, that, that connection is made. God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world with a purpose, to be holy and to be blameless in His sight. And then he says, in love He predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ. He talks about the blessing of election, to be chosen, to be predestined. Lots and lots that we can debate and discuss around the doctrine of predestination and so on, and I don't want to go there right now. But just a blessing that even before creation, God had me in mind. And, and this is the other thing that I want to challenge you to do, 
So often we read, especially when there's a bit of a, a theological debate about something, we made it into exactly that, a theological debate. It's something we reason about. There's nothing wrong in, in doing that because we learn if we do reason about certain things. But we also may miss the point, and that is to make it very personal and intimate. And so when I read this, yeah, my thoughts, my mind, uh, my mind goes in the direction of some debates and some issues and how does it all work and how, how can I work that out for myself to understand it better. But at the end of the day, it's not only about that. It's also about the fact that God chose, and this is my challenge to you, put your name or your personal pronoun, your first personal pronoun in here, me or I or whatever or mine. You put that in and it says, for he, God, chose me, Gerard Venter, in Christ before the creation of the world so that I must be holy and blameless in God's sight. In love, God predestined me to be adopted as His son. And you can say daughter or child or whatever. And if you then go through this passage, it really becomes a wonderful blessing. Just the blessing of just reading this as you then start looking at those different blessings. The blessing of adoption, the blessing of uh, being forgiven, as, as uh, Paul talks about that. Ultimately, he talks about the blessing of the Holy Spirit. It's given to us as a, as a first installment, as a guarantee, Paul says, for what God has in store for us. As you go through this particular passage, I want to challenge you to read it, to meditate on it, and to make it your own. Um, and much of what we are doing here is, is background study. It is addressing the hows and the wheres and the whats and the whys of the background of the Bible. But don't ever forget that ultimately the purpose, and my purpose with this course is really to help us to understand our relationship with God and to understand the Word of God so that the Word of God may speak uh, into our lives. And may He do so uh, as we continue to study tonight. So let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your wonderful blessings, Your spiritual blessings, blessings in the heavenly realm, that you have given to us, poured out on us, in and through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that Jesus died for us, to make it possible for us to know you, to be chosen by you, to be forgiven, and to be in a relationship with you. We also thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit as a first installment, as a guarantee of what you have in store for us in the future. And Lord, we want to worship you tonight. We also want to ask you to continue to bless us and open our minds as we study your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The New Testament so far. I'm doing a, a very brief review right at the beginning of every lecture. Part of that is so that at the end we, all, we will have a sort of a complete picture of the whole of the, the New Testament. It also serves the purpose of memorizing the books of the New Testament. And I hope you are in that process. And I'm, in a certain sense, I'm actually doing it for you every week by starting with a bit of a review. Uh, we've looked at the intertestamental period, the way God prepared the world for the coming of Jesus. We then looked at the gospel story, the story of Jesus. And we studied the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We then looked at the gospel of John uh, with a very different flavor uh, ethos, if you wish, primarily focusing on the person of Jesus Christ. From there, we have gone and looked at the early church story, the story of the early church uh, in the book of Acts. It ends with Paul in prison. Uh, that also creates the backdrop to the letters that we are studying right now. Uh, because last week, we looked at the life of the Apostle Paul, his ministry, his background, and how we anchor him into history uh, with his own chronology. And then uh, from that point on, we, we looked at letter writing, and then Romans was the first letter that we, we looked at. And very unfortunate, we only have about half an hour or so spend, to spend um, that we could spend on Romans. And then the first and second letters that Paul wrote, or as they are called in our Bible, first and second Corinthians, uh, we have seen that there may have been at least four letters written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth, we only have number two and number four probably in that order, and those are called First and Second Corinthians in our Bible. So tonight we are going to go further and look at Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, uh, those four letters written by the Apostle Paul as well. And again, I want to encourage you to read 
beyond uh, what we are doing in this course and what we are doing in this lecture time together, uh, either the textbooks or any other good introduction to the New Testament. And there will be plenty of names and cities and co-workers of Paul, um, theological concepts that we're going to raise and highlight maybe just for a brief moment in this course. And, and so you would have to read beyond what we are doing here. Anything that grabs your attention. You want to know more about Titus or Epaphroditus or uh, Timothy or uh, Barnabas and those, you would have to go to a Bible dictionary or even online and find out more about those. And some of the concepts, we, we're not doing a theological study of the books right now. In the last module, we'll look at the whole picture of the Bible and, and have more of a theological study. Uh, but some of these uh, concepts will grab your attention. The concept of grace or salvation, uh, the law and grace and so on, uh, may, just, may just grab your attention. And I want to encourage you to read further along those lines. When we look at the major dates in Paul's life, this is a reminder. We've done it last week. Um, for, for the past two weeks, I've highlighted these dates uh, already. His first missionary journey after coming to Christ somewhere in the 30s, um, by about 47 uh, his first missionary journey took place. That was followed with the next major event in his life, the Jerusalem Council, Acts chapter 15, where he and Barnabas and others visited Jerusalem, and they had the debate around the law and the circumcision and the impact of the law on the Gentiles. And then the, the second missionary journey took place from 49 to 52. It's during that time that uh, we anchor him in history with a visit to uh, or when he was brought before Gallio in the city of Corinth. 52 to 57, the third missionary journey. And then from 57 to 64, we have his trip to Jerusalem, his arrest, and then ultimately his trip uh, to Rome, where we find him at the end of the book of Acts. So those, gives us, uh, those dates give us just a little bit of an overview and a background for actually where we are also heading tonight in terms of the letters. The first one is the letter to the Galatians. And um, the way I personally summarize this is law and grace. I think Paul talks about that particular concept. Uh, it's an interesting uh, book, and I'm going to read just a few verses. Um, we've done this with the prophets when we studied the Old Testament, and I, I haven't done much of that uh, for the New Testament so far, but let's just read a few verses at the beginning of the book of Galatians. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers with me, to the churches in Galatia. And then the greeting, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom the glory forever and e to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So that's the introduction, Paul introducing himself. Paul writing to churches in Galatia. There's the greeting and now the body of the letter. And as he jumps in, uh, this is a strange one. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evident, evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. And then he repeats that. He feels so, uh, so strongly about a person who preaches another gospel to be absolutely condemned. This is strong language, especially at the beginning of a letter. So obviously the question you need to ask is, what's the background? What, what's going on in Paul's mind? And so much of what we have seen in the book of Acts uh, even that uh, council in Acts chapter 15 in the year 49 AD, those things actually provide us with a bit of a background uh, to the issues that are addressed in the book of Galatians or the letter to the Galatians. In many ways, the epistle to the Galatians reminds us of Paul's letter to the Romans. There are many uh, issues that are similarly addressed, like the law, the grace issue, uh, both of those are strongly uh, pointed out by the Apostle Paul in Romans as well. And, and as I have just read to you, this epistle really stands out as the one where Paul directly confronts the false teachings that are going on. Now, he does that everywhere, but nowhere does he do it in such uh, 
uh, I almost said crude language, but really such direct language where he addresses these people. Uh, and, and then, of course, the Galatian churches who have fallen for some of the false teachings uh, going around. We learn much about the concept uh, of law and grace or the relationship between law and grace in the book of Galatians. Paul makes that comparison in this letter when he talks about the law. And he would be one, as we saw last week, who would know this extremely well. He has been thoroughly educated in the law. He was a rabbi. He was well on his way climbing the ladder in Judaism. Uh, and, and so he would understand all of that. Uh, but then Jesus saved him. And then he came to understand the concept of grace. And so Paul was ideally suited to make a comparison between what happened in the Old Testament and how we make the application of that in the New Testament era. Galatians should be read um, as a letter uh, in terms of background, historical background, either against the background of Paul's first missionary journey or very close to the journey coming just out of that. And that is Acts chapter 13, and that's the first time when the church at Antioch sent Paul and Barnabas out. He was then still called Saul. Saul and Barnabas out into, uh, uh, into the mission, mission field, as it were. They, they uh, covered the southern region of the province of Galatia. Um, and as they came back, and during the second and the third missionary journeys, Paul went much further and he also covered some of the northern regions of the same province, which he didn't cover initially in the first uh, missionary journey. And um, those two journeys we, we read about, um, well, the second one we read about in Acts 15 and 16. When it comes to the writing of Galatians, very little doubt, very little argument by anybody um, about the fact that Paul is the author uh, of this letter. In terms of recipients, interesting, it's not one single church, but Paul is writing to the churches in Galatia, um, as we see in the NIV translation, to the churches in Galatia, that's what he calls them. The exact region, however, is a little bit debatable, and we'll give a little bit of attention to that in a moment. But in terms of the date, the occasion, uh, why Paul wrote is not an issue, uh, that comes out even in that opening sort of paragraphs very clearly why Paul is writing to the Galatians. The time when he writes, uh, there is a difference of opinion, and that depends on the destination debate. When it comes to uh, the purpose, the letter is addressed to the churches, in other words, giving the impression that there were several churches planted by the Apostle Paul in the region, and he's addressing uh, some of the issues, um, and the issue, one of the major issues, is this of uh, some of the Jewish Christians or Christians coming from Judea who have followed in the footsteps of Paul after they heard about the Gentiles coming to know Christ and they were going around teaching them it's okay to believe in Jesus and you have to believe in Jesus but in order to be a true Christian you also need to keep the law in the Old Testament. More specifically, and this is something that Paul highlights several times, the circumcision. You've got to go through the circumcision. And it's amazing how culturally and spiritually, uh, this thing of circumcision uh, is very important to the Jews and, and literally all the way till today. They felt so strongly about it that that's the reason why they arrested Paul in Jerusalem. They thought that he had brought someone who was uncircumcised. That's what they call that person. And, and of course, calling a person uncircumcised was not only the physical circumcision or the act of circumcision. It was more than that. It was by circumcision and the physical act of circumcision, you're really saying that I have adopted Judaism as my faith and I believe in the one God that the Jews believe in and so on. And if you, if you were not circumcised, then you, you didn't believe in this God and therefore you're a Gentile, a heathen, and you're not allowed to associate with the Jews. And when Paul ultimately, after his third missionary journey, when he was in the temple, they thought they saw one of his companions with him in the city earlier on, and they just assumed that he brought him into the temple uh, with him, with Paul. And, and so a riot erupted as a result of that. That's how strongly they felt about this. And so you need to understand that background, to understand how certain Jews, who now also believe in Jesus, had major difficulty getting over this hurdle of the possibility of Gentiles also coming into 
the fold of God, as it were. They would see, and they would have seen, Christianity simply as an extension of what God was doing in the Old Testament, and therefore, in a certain sense, almost a version of Christianity, of Judaism rather. Um, in fact, this is the way the Romans looked at it. It was just another sect, um, and there were many different sects within Judaism. Here's just another expression of Judaism. And so some Christians actually saw Christianity as another expression of really Judaism, if you wish. And so they would go around and teach people that they need to become Jewish in order to be Christian. You want to be a true Christian, you also need to accept Judaism as such. Uh, Paul wrote, therefore, to refute their arguments and to defend his authority as one teaching the truth of the gospel, having come to know Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and, and having had a revelation from God. I can only assume um, that Paul must have heard somehow in his grappling with that whole, whole issue, he must have heard either directly the voice of God or even coming to the conclusion of his studying and reasoning with different people that it is not necessary for the Gentiles to be circumcised. And therefore he went on this trip, um, just in case he was wrong, he went on this trip to Jerusalem where they debated this issue. And we know the story from Acts chapter 15, how even the apostles in Jerusalem said, after the debate and listening to the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit guided them and said, no, nope, we've decided they don't have to be circumcised. And so Paul felt affirmed in his own belief about what he uh, was teaching the Gentiles up to that point in time. If you look at um, this map, uh, here is the Mediterranean uh, with uh, Antioch and Syria where he left initially. And he, he went to the island of Cyprus. And from the island of Cyprus, he went across to the mainland, which is modern-day Turkey. And then southern Galatia is this darkened area over here. Well, that is all of Galatia. But in his initial trip, he, he covered the, just the southern part of Galatia as he was going back uh, inland uh, to Antioch. And as he was going, he was planting uh, some churches. Now, Galatia was bounded on the north by Bithynia and uh, Paphlagonia, on the east by Pontus and Cappadocia, on the south by Cilicia and Lycia. Um, and, and Cilicia was the province where Paul was born, and, and Tarsus was there, and on the west by Phrygia, constructed originally over Hittite land. The modern capital of Turkey, Ankara, or ancient Ankara, was also the capital of ancient Galatia, the province of Galatia. We now know, of course, um, from our background study, that the, the Romans divided the, the countries, bigger countries, into smaller uh, manageable provinces or units, and even the land of Canaan was divided into three provinces, as we have seen uh, before. And so the debate is actually whether Paul is writing to the southern churches in Galatia, that would mean after his first missionary journey, uh, or whether he's writing to the northern churches or the churches in all of Galatia, including the north, and that would place the letter either after the second or after the third, or towards the end of the third a missionary journey. And that's roughly the argument you have on this map. It's a much more detailed map. Um, but Galatia is in this area over here, and the cities of Lystra, Derby, Iconium, and then there is Pisidian, Antioch, and those would be in the region of Galatia uh, as, we, uh, as we have looked at the first missionary journey of Paul. And so there are, uh, when it comes to the churches uh, in Galatia during his second missionary journey, Paul accompanied by Silas and Timothy visited the region of Galatia. That's the quote from, from the, uh, the book of Acts in Acts 16, where he was detained uh, by sickness. Uh, he tells us in, in Galatians chapter 4, verse uh, 13, um, when he talks about his journeys and so on, as you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Now, he doesn't uh, tell us exactly how long he was detained, but some illness held him up. And whether it's on his first missionary journey or later, we're not sure. But it looks like he's talking about his first missionary journey and he was able to stay longer or may not able to. As a result of an illness, he was um, then forced to stay longer. But on his third missionary journey, he went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia. That's the way the quote is uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, during the journeys of Paul, he was received with enthusiasm in Galatia. In Acts chapter 14, for example, we read how he was almost worshipped uh, 
people wanted to bring sacrifices to him when they saw uh, a healing taking place and so on. And he had great difficulty uh, getting the people not to do that, but to actually worship God. And that whole thing turned around into a riot and he had to flee for his life uh, once again and was stoned. Uh, when it comes to the destination debate, uh, again, let me just give you this map. The year is Antioch, and when you go inland, on his first missionary journey, he went to the island of Cyprus, and then cut around this way. On his uh, second and third missionary journeys, he covered more of those areas, and then went further north uh, into the province of Galatia. If Paul wrote Galatians shortly after his first missionary journey, then the destination would be southern Galatia. He hasn't been to northern Galatia yet. Uh, but if he wrote after the second and third missionary journeys, it could include the whole region or perhaps even primarily the northern churches or the northern Galatia um, region. Um, and the place from where Paul is writing is not 100% certain. He gives us very little indication in the book where he was when he wrote this letter. Now, when it comes to northern Galatia, just briefly, at the end of the day, it makes no massive difference to the meaning of the book. The, the book is significant as it is. It's understandable. Uh, the debate is very clear, which I have already introduced. Um, and so it really doesn't make a massive or a huge difference to where Paul was addressing the letter or to which region he addressed it. Um, but the northern Galatia theory does leave enough room and time for the Jerusalem council to have taken place in 49 and then for several years, uh, six, seven or eight years to pass by where this concept could now have uh, sunken into Paul's mind and other minds so that this is really the teaching that uh, should happen. It also takes into account Paul's second journey to Galatia and we read about uh, further visits in Acts chapter 16 and 18. And furthermore, the similarities between uh, Romans, and I've already pointed that out in terms of law and grace, as, and, and that of Galatia or Galatians, uh, would then be, make a lot more sense because Paul would be in a similar frame of mind uh, when he was writing Romans and also the book uh, to the Galatians. That would place it towards the middle, uh, towards the end of the 50s, like 55, 6, or 58, or 59, maybe even. If the destination is southern Galatia, then it would fit in around the visit to Jerusalem in, uh, in the year 49. Uh, and, and again, we don't know whether Paul wrote the letter either before or after. My personal suspicion would be that he wrote it after the Jerusalem council, because by now the debate is, is finished. Um, they, have, they have the approval of the leadership in Jerusalem that this is the way forward. And Paul would then have a lot more authority in terms of writing with the backing of the apostles uh, to tell them what has happened. And, and, and um, if that is the case, then the southern region would be in focus and it would be earlier in the ministry of the apostle Paul. And that would make it about 48 if it's before the council or maybe 49 uh, or late 49 immediately after the council took place in Jerusalem. In terms of the contents and out, outline, the content and outline of Galatians, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 10, uh, we talked about the life of the Apostle Paul last week, and uh, we have a good summary. Uh, sometimes not, not easy to, uh, to harmonize what Paul is saying over here in terms of the way he approaches uh, his own history and the way Ac the book of Acts is telling it. So obviously there are gaps in our knowledge, but in the first chapter he goes on, uh, and he says in verse 11, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. This is the confirmation that I said to you earlier on, where Paul claimed that he had a, a direct revelation from God. This is not something he was taught. He didn't go to some rabbi or apostle or anybody else. In fact, he denies that that ever happened. He received this directly from God. Um, and then he goes on to talk about his previous life as, a, as a, a, a Jew who was persecuting the Christians. Then he talks about how he came to Christ. Um, and he says, and, and I want to read this in, in verse uh, 16, he says, uh, 
uh, because God revealed His Son to me, uh, in me so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles. He said, I did not consult any man after that happened, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. When you read the book of Acts, it seems like he was converted, he went to Damascus, he was prayed for by Ananias, he started immediately preaching the gospel, then he was led down the wall and he was on his way to Jerusalem. Now when you read this, it doesn't look like that. Paul is saying there's a gap and this is where we have gaps in our knowledge of the life of the Apostle Paul. Uh, he seems to say, I, I was in Damascus, I was threatened, I then left and went to Arabia, and uh, then I went back to Damascus, and it may be on that second time, and Acts is not concerned about those details, that may be when, when the Jews tried to kill him, and then he was led down the wall, then he went to Jerusalem for the first time to go and meet uh, uh, Peter and, and the apostles. He didn't go to Jerusalem for the first time, but in terms of being a Christian for the first time, he then went to meet them. So that's the way he introduces his uh, story, his ministry, and we read about that, and he goes on all the way to chapter 2, uh, verse 21, uh, where he even tells us about uh, a little uh, disagreement, not a little one, actually a, a, a quite a disagreement with the apostle Peter when he was in Antioch, and we know the story in Acts chapter 11 and then in 13, how Barnabas brought him to Antioch to be one of the preachers there. And it was on that occasion or during that occasion, apparently, that Peter came on a visit. Uh, and, and he was happy to associate with the Gentiles. I mean, after all, it was Peter who had the vision in Acts chapter 10 to go to Cornelius. So it wasn't un unusual or uncommon for Peter by this time. And we're talking maybe a year or two or three later. But then some Jews who held a different view came and visited Antioch, and they, they came from Jerusalem. And suddenly Peter withdrew from his contact with the Gentiles, and he only associated with the Jews. And Paul confronted him directly, and that's what he tells us uh, in that second little story, uh, which is quite an interesting one to read, uh, where he said, I, I, I opposed Peter in terms of uh, the way he went about this. And then in chapter 3, he starts talking again about this issue of the law and the grace. Uh, faith or the observance of the law is the heading in the NIV. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you have heard? And in that sentence, Paul makes the difference, the distinction between trying to please God through observing the law or pleasing God by simply believing in God or putting your faith and your trust in Him. And that's the difference between grace and law. Grace says if you believe in God, you have salvation. Law says keep all these things and then you will have salvation. And Paul says the law no longer applies because through the keeping of the law, I was never able to please God. It is by grace and by God's grace and faith in Him that I was saved. And he has a long argument, I'm not going to go into that, uh, but where he talks about Abraham and Hagar, Hagar and Sarah uh, and so on in uh, chapter 4. Um, he appeals then for maturity uh, in chapter 4 verses 8 to 31. And that's where he talks about Hagar and Sarah as examples. Chapter 5, um, as a result of his explanation of grace and law up to this point in time, he says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Uh, stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. He's just talked about Hagar and Sarah, making the comparison. Hagar is the woman of slavery. Sarah is the woman of freedom. And out of, out of slavery, um, the one child was born. Out of freedom, the other child was born. And he says, we are, we are children of freedom. Jesus Christ lives in us. God has chosen us. He's, he's He's given us this freedom and we should live with the freedom and not be taken up by law and legalistic requirements once again. And he goes into all those kind of things that, that, that uh, the Jews or those who feel strongly about the law feel that they should keep. And then in chapter 6, uh, verse, verses 11 to 18, we have the conclusion and the final appeal. Some of the major uh, themes in the book of Galatians, the true and only gospel is the gospel of freedom in Jesus Christ. 
Paul's authority as an apostle and uh, telling the story and the revelation of God uh, and his own history. Uh, he really is telling the Galatians why he is an apostle and why he can be regarded as an apostle and why he has the authority to write them a letter uh, like this. And then Paul's life and conversion. Um, we would be much poorer in our knowledge if it wasn't for this description of the life of the Apostle Paul. And then he talks about what in Romans is called justification by faith and by faith alone as compared to the place of the law. And Paul makes that comparison. And then the freedom in Christ, which I've already highlighted. I want to encourage you to read about Paul's uh, conversion experience, uh, the way he tells it. And then in chapter 2, verse 20, we have a great verse where he says, uh, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. In other words, if we still believe that there is a way that we can actually work our way to God by keeping the law, then Christ died for nothing. Now, no one, none of us would want to argue that way, and that's, that's precisely what Paul is saying to the Galatians. You, you nullifying the, the death of Jesus by trying to keep the law. There's nothing that we can do by keeping the law. It's by receiving God's grace by faith that we are saved. He goes on, um, and I have not even highlighted the life in and by the Spirit so far. Galatians 5.22, we know the verse very well as the fruit of the Spirit, where Paul compares the fruit of the flesh or those who are not in the Spirit and those who live by the Spirit, the kind of fruit that we need. Uh, and then Paul's commitment to the cross, he highlights in chapter 6, verse 14. And he says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which... The world has been crucified for, to me and I to the world. Um, Paul was committed to Jesus, the cross of Christ, the gospel story. Uh, that's what he preached to uh, the people wherever he went. Now, having finished Galatians, as we follow the um, order of the books in our New Testament, we get to the book of Ephesians, and that introduces us to uh, another concept which I think I've only mentioned earlier on, and that's the prison letters. Uh, Paul is in prison somewhere. He's writing some letters, and I call it pastoring from prison. Although he is perhaps bound by chains or is uh, at least limited in terms of his movements, uh, Paul is not limited in terms of the guidance that he is able to give to the churches. Now, one of the questions we do need to ask ourselves is, where was Paul when he wrote the letters? And there are four letters we call the prison letters. And uh, the first one is Ephesians. We'll look at that in a moment. Philippians, Colossians, and then also the little book of Philemon. We'll look at the first three tonight. And then um, at a later stage, because Philemon only follows much later, uh, we will look at Philemon. But where was Paul? Well, there are several options. Um, there is... Uh, some reference, which is not a direct one, but Paul does talk in 1 Corinthians 15 about the possibility that he may have been, or we could come to the conclusion that he may have been in prison in, in Ephesus. In, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15.32, he says, If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained if the dead are not, ra uh, are not raised? Let us drink and eat, for tomorrow we die. Um, what Paul is saying is, I, in Ephesus, when I was in Ephesus, I fought with wild animals. Now, uh, by way of deduction, one can say, uh, I mean, you don't, you don't fight wild animals in the street because they don't walk in the street. Uh, was Paul in prison? And, and it was a common thing in those days for uh, prisoners to be put in a cage uh, or at least on, on some kind of a display where they had to fight wild animals. So some scholars say that in that reference, there may be an indirect reference to the fact that Paul was in prison in Ephesus, but we have no uh, other proof for that. We do know that he was in other prisons. We, um, we'll look at the book of Philippians in a moment. And in the city of Philippi, Paul was definitely in prison. That is told, the story is told to us in Acts chapter 16. We do know at the end of the book of Acts that he was in Caesarea for two years. Easily Paul could have written those letters. He had plenty of time uh, to write it from Caesarea. Uh, also, um, 
at the end of the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 28, we know that he, were, he spent two years in uh, prison conditions in the city of Rome. And then there is a, a second unknown and, and not um, referenced or unreferenced uh, prison imprisonment uh, that is in the church tradition, as, as we uh, saw last week, where Paul could have been back in prison again. Now, most scholars today accept the fact uh, that Paul, or accept as a fact, that Paul was in prison in Rome at the end of the book of Acts uh, when he wrote these prison letters. Um, the conditions are similar. When you make a comparison, for example, between Colossians and Philemon, same names, uh, same circumstances, and so on, so it seems um, very likely that Paul wrote these letters in quick succession, but to different churches and one individual uh, around the world at the time. And if that is true, then the date would be somewhere between 62 and 64, those two years when Paul spent time uh, in prison in Rome. That takes us to the book of Ephesians, uh, which we can call God's revelation in Christ, salvation by grace and by grace alone. Just by way of locating um, Ephesus on a map, from Antioch over here with Syria, um, the southern part of Galatia, as we saw, there's uh, the northern part of Galatia up there. If you go around and you're on the western side of modern-day Turkey, uh, you have the province of Asia, or Asia Minor, as it was known. And the letters written to the churches in the book of Revelation were addressed to seven churches in this region as well. Uh, but the city of Ephesus is right on the coast there. And we, last week, uh, maybe we haven't mentioned that, um, but when Paul was on his way to, and I'll mention that now uh, a little bit later on, but when Paul was down, on his way to Jerusalem at the end of his third missionary journey, he stopped in the city of Miletus, and he called for the elders of Ephesus, uh, the Ephesian church, to come and meet with him. And uh, Miletus is just south um, of Ephesus on, on this map. So that's where the city is. It was a city of ancient Anatolia during the period known as, the, as Classical Greece. It was located in Ionia, a, a province of that area, where the Seister River flows into the Aegean Sea. The importance of the city as a commercial center declined as the harbor slowly filled with silt from the river. Today's archaeological site lies three kilometers south of the Selçuk uh, district, uh, of the Izmir province in Turkey. Uh, going back into the history of Ephesus a little bit, when Augustus became emperor in 27 BC, he made Ephesus instead of Pergamum, the capital of the proconsular Asia, Asia Minor, which covered the western part of Asia Minor. Ephesus entered an era of prosperity. It became the seat of, governor, of the governor, growing into a metropolis and a major city. At some stage, scholars reckon during that time of the first century it could have had uh, up to half a million inhabitants uh, by the, <coughs> the year 100. And that would have made it one of the largest cities, perhaps the second largest uh, next to Rome or after Rome. Um, and it was at its peak during the first and the second centuries AD when Paul uh, visited that area. Uh, here on the screen we have the remains of the Artemis temple, the temple of Artemis, and uh, we'll talk about her also in a moment. Uh, but it, Ephesus was well known as a center of pagan worship. It had this temple of Artemis or Diana. In Acts chapter 19 we read about that, and I'll come back to that also in a moment. But it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world uh, at the time. The occult played a prominent role in the city. There is a very interesting reference in Acts chapter 19 when Paul planted the church in Ephesus. Uh, and it tells us about people who came, became Christians. And it says, A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. And in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Now, 50,000 drachmas is not just a small amount of money. Uh, a drachma was worth one day's uh, worth of wages, uh, the value of one day's worth of wages. When you calculate that, 365, and divide that into 50,000, you come to... Uh, if, if my memory serves me correctly, more, about 130 years worth of salary. Now, think about 
a modern day salary of a, of a year long and multiply that by 130. And you can see the kind of value that people placed on occultic practices and books and materials and things that they accumulated. Um, and so Ephesus was a center for the practice of the occult. It was a center of emperor worship. Uh, we haven't even spoken about this before, but um, several of the emperors, not all of them, but several of the emperors believe that they have reached some kind of a divine status, and therefore they themselves must be worshipped. There were a few times in the Christian history, when uh, early church history, when Christians were persecuted, primarily because they would never say the word, the Caesar is Lord. Um, they would only believe that Jesus is Lord, and you can never say the emperor or the Caesar is Lord, and then they would be persecuted as a result of that. Now, they didn't say that Caesar was the only one. He, was, he needed to be acknowledged, and they sometimes would say to the Christians, you, you can believe in Jesus. All you need to say is Caesar is Lord, and then you can also believe that Jesus is Lord. And obviously, Christians refused to do that, and they were persecuted as a result. A city well known for its immorality, such as temple prostitution. I've mentioned this before, but, but really what you have is uh, people who serve in the temple as priests and priest, priestesses, uh, and, and they would offer their bodies, they would offer sex to the worshippers. And so by having sex with a temple prostitute, male and female, or male or female, uh, you would then really honor or worship your God. So you can see the kind of environment in which the Ephesian people live. This is a little statue, a picture of a statue of, the, uh, of Diana or Artemis, as, as she was known. Uh, the Ephesians believed that, that this statue or a statue of her dropped out of heaven and fell near their city. And so they were the guardians of, of um, the, the worship of Diana and built this enormous temple uh, to worship her. And uh, when, you, when you look at this, for example, it was a, f a fertility, uh, uh, sexual fertility type religion. And, and uh, here uh, on her front, there would be multiple breasts, for example, as a sign of fertility uh, and, and a sexual sign of fertility uh, as well. The Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, one of the seven wonders, I've said this before, was built around 550 B.C., so it's not, it wasn't a, a new phenomenon by the time of the first century A.D. It was about four times the size of the Parthenon. Ephesus was part of the kingdom of Pergamum, which uh, Attalus III bequeathed to Rome in 133 B.C. Ephesus was the most important Roman city of the proconsular um, Asia, situated at the mouth of the Seister River on a gulf of the Aegean Sea. It flourished as an important commercial and export center for Asia. Um, and then there are different um, numbers there. Uh, obviously, scholars uh, grapple with the numbers of, of, of population. The church at Ephesus. Now, the initial church was founded by the Apostle Paul. There's an interesting story when you go to uh, Acts chapter 18, and you find Paul arriving in the city. He stayed there. He left uh, some of his co-workers there, and he moved on, promising to come back. And uh, he did do that. He did come back. And then as he came back, he encountered or found uh, a number of disciples of John the Baptist. Now, that is another interesting phenomenon that we don't, we're not really told how that thing happened. So again, somewhere in the um, about 30 or 20s um, of, of uh, our era, uh, 20 um, or 30 before Jesus came, or before Jesus came onto the public scene, uh, John the Baptist had a ministry. He had disciples, and it seems like some of those disciples moved around the world, all the way to Ephesus, where there were disciples of John the Baptist. And Paul then um, challenged them in terms of what they believed. They have not even heard that the Holy Spirit had come. So they obviously had a, a, a warped idea of Christ and who he was, and did he even come, and so on and so on. Um, but they were Christian in orientation, if you wish. Paul then taught them well. And, and either combined them with the, with the church that was now already beginning to run uh, or formed another church. Again, we're not sure exactly how the story uh, developed from there. But Acts chapter 19 tells us how Paul was able to stay in the city, preach in the synagogue for several months. Then he was kicked out, took a bunch of people with him, and they started the church. And he stayed there for another two years using Ephesus as a major commercial city. 
uh, where, where several people came into the city, pretty much like Joburg uh, and, and most of the, the modern cities around the world today, where people flock to the cities uh, and they flock to, to Ephesus from that whole region. And uh, we are told very clearly, in fact, I read some of that already, uh, it said that uh, in this way the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Uh, it eventually tells us how um, Paul stayed in the city uh, in, in Acts chapter 19 uh, and um, in verse 10. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Probably in a bit of an exaggeration, but the point is that over that whole region, uh, the gospel spread with, with Ephesus as the center. And Paul was able, not necessarily personally, but through his co-workers, to send people out and to spread the gospel. That's going to become important when we look a bit later at, at a couple of the other letters as well. This is the library, the remains of the library of Ephesus at the time. Uh, when we look at Paul's ongoing work, he established a good base, uh, as I said before. The book of Revelation, um, probably 50 years later, uh, is a good example of the fact that there was a well-established church, certainly not without its problems as we see in Revelation, uh, but certainly still a church that was, an existing, that was in existence. After a major riot in the city, which happened around this whole issue of Artemis or Diana, uh, little statues uh, with, that people bought and, and people made huge amounts of money by selling these artifacts to uh, the worshippers and the, the tourists who came to the city. And it became a threat to them, the fact that Christianity was taking over. I and mean, when you think about 50,000 drachmas worth of stuff being burned up uh, and so on, you, you can just imagine the impact that they made. Um, and so they weren't happy and they caused a riot and Paul eventually had to leave under duress. At the end of his third missionary journey, Paul met with and spoke to the elders of Ephesus, Acts chapter 20, uh, when he was on his way to Jerusalem and he stopped over in the harbor city of Miletus. When it comes to the writing of Ephesians, the early church tradition very strongly supports Paul as the author. There is a, a slight problem when it comes to the letter itself from a textual critical point of view. It says, uh, to the saints in Ephesus, and you'll see in the NIV, uh, or if you have a modern translation, probably a footnote. And uh, in the footnote it says, some early manuscripts do not have the words in Ephesus. Um, it makes for very difficult reading. The literal translation of the Greek without these words would read something like, to the holy ones who are, and, and then there's nothing that follows. And so uh, scholars are, are not sure whether the words in Ephesus either dropped out or whether they were added at a later stage. Uh, but by, by the third century or so, second and third centuries, the letter got the name of Ephesians or to the church at Ephesus. And there, there are several uh, possibilities. Uh, it may be that a copyist left it out uh, and simply assumed that people knew it was written to the church at Ephesus. The other option or the other possibility is that Paul intended it to be a circular, that it should be read by other churches as well. He tells the church in Colossae that they must read the letter that he wrote uh, to the church at Laodicea and that they must swap letters as well. So it would have been an uncommon thing for Paul to address a letter to multiple churches as he did in the case of of um, the churches in Galatia. Again, it would be strange that Paul wouldn't mention that, something like to the churches in Asia Minor or something like that. Uh, so we're, we're a bit uncertain as far as that is concerned. And in the, with the lack of evidence around that, I think it's pretty uh, good for us uh, to simply accept that the letter was written to the church in Ephesus. In terms of purpose, the exact purpose is not known, whereas Galatians is so clear uh, you are believing the circumcision people, and I'm against them, and I want to tell you, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, the letter to the Ephesians is not 100% direct as is the one to the Galatians. There are several options or possibilities. It may have been the occultic background uh, that prompted Paul to write about that. And it is in this letter that we read about the armor of God, and where Paul says... Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Now, against the occultic background in Ephesus, that statement now makes a lot more sense, knowing that uh, 
This is what they have encountered. They, they were pretty much aware of the evil spiritual world out there. Um, and they have now come to Christ. And Paul says, you need to take on the armor of God. Also, disunity could be another reason. Uh, that was a fairly common phenomenon in the, in the first century. Still is in the church, the issue of disunity. A Gentile and Jew living together. He's got a long section where he writes about the need for us to express our unity. In fact, that's the way he starts in chapter 4. When he says, um, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another. Make every effort, in verse 3, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Um, and then, as I said, the letter could have been written as a circular to churches uh, in that whole region. When we look at the outline of Ephesians, and here is the uh, recovered theater, a Greek theater, uh, in the old city of Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus is no longer a harbor uh, on, on the ocean. Uh, the river silked up, uh, and slowly but surely the, uh, the ocean line uh, sort of moved away from the city. So we, if you go to, to the ruins of the old Ephesus, uh, the, it's no longer on the harbor. It's no longer a harbor area or on the ocean. Paul introduces himself, um, as we've read in chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. He then talks about the blessings of God. I shared a little bit about that in uh, verses 13 to 14. We then have a beautiful prayer. In fact, we have two prayers that Paul prays for the Ephesians and uh, makes wonderful preaching material. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And you need to rest, read the rest of the prayer. You also need to put yourself in a position where you receive this prayer. And then you can put yourself in a position where you can pray this prayer for someone else as well, uh, which really makes for uh, good praying material. Chapter 2, the chapter on grace. Uh, most of us know this very well, but chapter 2 verse 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Pretty much what he said to the Galatians, although he doesn't highlight the law or the circumcision issue here in Ephesians as he does in Galatians. And then it's the unity issue. Uh, we're one in Christ in chapter 2 verses 11 to 22. Paul's ministry, and he prays another prayer. Um, so you need to really go to chapter 3 verse 14 and you'll find another prayer. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, and, and so forth. In chapter 4, all the way to chapter 6, a bit more practical, uh, several issues uh, such as unity, new life, holiness, victory over evil, uh, family, social relationships. Uh, chapter 5 is that one uh, in chapter 5 verse 22 where we find uh, a description of wives and husbands. Uh, oftentimes you'll hear a, a preacher on, the, uh, on this particular issue at a wedding um, and so on and relationships. Uh, chapter 6, the well-known armor of God in verses 10 to 20. And then the conclusion uh, we find in verse uh, 21. Again, it's greetings and some arrangements uh, where Paul sends Tychicus and others who sends greetings uh, and so forth. Some of the major themes that we find in the book of Ephesians, the blessings of God, which I've highlighted already, the prayers, again I've highlighted that. Unity is a theme that we find in Ephesians. And then responsible Christian living. Um, I, I love the passages about parents and children, wives and husbands and slaves and owners and, and so on. And it, it really speaks to us about daily living, the Christian life and what it means to us. And then victorious living is, is about living a victorious life in this world where we encounter the spiritual battle, uh, but we have the power of God which is much stronger and will help us. Some of the passages to read, the blessings of God, saved by grace, the prayers, unity, marriage, and the armor of God. Now before we continue, let's take a break and have some tea, and um, then we'll come back and do Philippians and Colossians. All right, welcome back. And uh, as we continue, we'll look at the book of Philippians, the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians, uh, the location. Uh, you, you may remember Paul on his missionary journeys uh, going through 
um, the Asia Minor region to the north of what is modern-day Turkey, all the way to the city of Troas. And when he arrived there, he tried several different directions, didn't work, and they took it as the Holy Spirit preventing them from going to certain regions. And then he had what we call the Macedonian call. He had a dream uh, where a Macedonian, and however he recognized the Macedonian, whether they wore particular kind of clothing or had certain facial features, but he certainly had a, a Macedonian in a dream saying, come over here. And then from Troas, they crossed over and went to Neapolis, and from Neapolis they went to Philippi. And so that's where the city of Philippi is, which is actually in modern-day Greece, uh, which is in, in Europe. Um, this is where Istanbul is, right there. So this part here, Istanbul is, is the city in the world uh, sitting on two continents uh, simultaneously with a little stretch right there in the middle. So this is all Europe, and the other side uh, is Asia. Philippi was a city in eastern Macedonia, in northern ancient Greece, founded by Philip II in 356 and abandoned in the 14th century after the Ottoman uh, conquest. And the present municipality, uh, Philippoi, is located near the ruins of the ancient city, so it's quite close, but it's not exactly the same uh, location uh, anymore. Um, here we have some of the ruins of the city of Philippi, uh, the city that Paul um, would have uh, uh, visited. Uh, this is Philippi's Forum and the Basilica, seen from the Acropolis. The city was named after Philip II, the person who, who uh, founded the city uh, of Macedon. He was also the father of Alexander the Great. And when we did that intertestamental period history, we looked very briefly at Alexander the Great. Philippi was located in Macedonia on the Via Ignatia, uh, the major east-west commercial highway uh, running from Rome all the way, uh, try and get the uh, uh, armies of Rome uh, to, to take control or to exercise control over the world. Uh, there are some interesting archaeological finds in the city going all the way back to uh, Paul. Uh, the jail, the little stream or river where Lydia was converted. Uh, it was a Roman colony with Roman soldiers living there. And uh, just as Tarsus, where Paul was born, uh, the, the Philippians enjoyed special privileges. In other words, they would have received Roman citizenship when they, was, when they were born, um, and lower taxes and several other privileges as part of the Roman Empire at the time. I've mentioned Via Ignatia. Here are some of the remains still of that road that the Romans uh, built back then. Um, it was built in the beginning of 145 BC, or starting then, and at its greatest extent connected Byzantium with the Adriatic ports. This route was Rome's primary artery to the east, and Philippi was an important outpost along the road. The Ignatian Way made it easier for Rome to move troops throughout the empire, and it was the route that Paul traveled from Neapolis to Philippi. In terms of the history of Philippi, during the period of Macedonian supremacy, Philippi had no particular importance, but was simply one among the cities of the kingdom. In 42 BC, a battle between the forces of Brutus and Cassius, or Cassius on the one side and Ant Antony and Octavian on the other, made the name of the city known to the whole world. Immediately after the battle, numbers of Roman colonists were settled at Philippi and the villages around, and the Roman colony Colonia August Julia Philippensis was founded. And uh, this is where Paul eventually ended up. When it comes to the church in Philippi, we are told the story in Acts chapter 16. Uh, I have given you a brief introduction to that. Paul had that vision, and he saw the Macedonian. They went across to uh, Europe. Uh, they ended up in the city of Philippi. Whatever made them go through Neapolis and go to Philippi, we're not exactly sure. And whether they even preach at Neapolis, as I said to you before, uh, much of the information that uh, we, we sometimes pick up in the letters and so on, uh, that information is simply assumed in the book of Acts or either just um, ignored. Uh, there's obviously a lot more in those books than we have. But there was the Macedonian call, and when they arrived in the city, they looked for a place where Jews would gather. There was no synagogue in the city of Philippi. That would be Paul's first call, uh, port of call when he arrived in a the city. There was none. 
but they were Jews, and the Jews would find themselves a place of worship. Uh, and in this particular case, a river outside the city. And so on the Sabbath day, they went there to look for this place. And they found Lydia, who was a dealer in purple cloth. And um, they led Lydia to the Lord, and she invited them into her home. It was in this city, during this time of Paul's stay there, that a slave girl started following and um, screaming and shouting all the time, pointing to them as people from God. In fact, she was, she was really speaking the truth, but became uh, an irritating uh, nuisance in the background. And so Paul turned around and drove out the evil spirit uh, within her, and uh, she was making a lot of income for her owners uh, with truth-telling and so on, and she lost that ability. And, of course, they then caused a riot in the city, uh, which, which um, ended Paul and Silas up in prison. Uh, it was in the prison where they sang those songs at midnight, and the prison rocked, uh, shook, um, and uh, the jailer just about killed himself. But then Paul was able to lead the jailer to the Lord. He and his whole household were baptized. The next morning, the officials said to Paul and Silas, or they sent word to the jailer and said, you can let them go, they're free to go. This was one of the occasions where Paul insisted on his Roman citizenship. And he said, no, they, I'm a Roman citizen, and uh, they mistreated me, and therefore I insist on them coming and dealing with it. And so they had a bit of a scrick, and they came, and they led Paul and plead, pleaded with him to please leave uh, the city. So that gives us the background of the planting of the church in uh, Philippi. In terms of purpose, why Paul wrote this letter, Paul was sending Epaphroditus, uh, that becomes clear in chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, uh, a member of the church back to the church in uh, Philippi. Uh, when we read that, he says, But I think it is necessary, and he's talking about Epaphroditus, to send him back to you, my, my brother, my fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you send to take care of my needs. Um, for he longs uh, for all of you, and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. And therefore I'm all the more eager to send him back. So it seems like as one of the reasons Paul uh, wrote to them, uh, they've already sent something, uh, some support, financial support, maybe even other support to Paul to help him on his missionary journeys. And they also send uh, the man, Epaphroditus, to come and assist Paul. He traveled with Paul, but he was now longing to go home. And Paul then used the opportunity to write to the church and sent the letter with Epaphroditus to take it back to his home church uh, because he was ill and so forth. Paul also needed to make some arrangements for Timothy's visit to the church. He's sending Timothy to go and check out the situation there. He says, I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one like him, and, and so forth. Um, and then also, Paul expressed gratitude for the church's support. We find that uh, at the end of the letter, towards the end of the letter, where Paul um, writes to them at the beginning about their support, but also uh, in, uh, at the end where he, once again, uh, in chapter 4, verse 14, he says, Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in respect to giving and receiving except you only. Um, and in the first part of the letter, in chapter 1, verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you, and all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So there's, there are clear indications that this church helped and supported the Apostle Paul, and is now writing to thank them for that. He also expressed fairly general concerns about false teachings. He doesn't highlight anything in, in particular, although there are uh, references or possible references to uh, Judaism. He also needed to give them reassurance regarding his imprisonment. He was in prison, uh, and uh, at the end of his third missionary journey, it seems like, and um, he's writing... Uh, to give them the assurance, or he was maybe in another prison, but he was certainly telling them that they don't have to worry about um, him. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard, and he may be referring here to Roman soldiers, and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, much 
uh, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. When we look at the outline, um, there's an introduction, your similar um, normal introduction, and then where Paul and I've read part of that, where he thanks God for them. Then he gives them uh, the assurance about his prison circumstances, and as we saw earlier, it could be any prison, but probably the Roman imprisonment when Paul is writing to them. Um, there's a life worthy of the gospel in, um, in chapter 1, verses 27 and further. And then also the warning against false teachers in chapter 3. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things. As a, as a safeguard for you, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship the Spirit uh, by the Spirit of God. Now, there is um, what seems to be a more of a direct reference to the circumcision crowd, uh, those who came along. And um, despite what I said earlier on, uh, Paul was, if we take the Roman imprisonment as the, as the one uh, with the uh, occasion of this letter, then there would have been time for those circumcision people to come around to Philippi and try and mislead them. Uh, in chapter 4, he talks about unity, joy, steadfastness. In chapter 4, uh, there is gratitude for the gifts. In chapter 4, verses 10 to 20. And then also he ends the book with greetings and a benediction. Some of the themes in the book of Philippians, joy, um, you, you almost can't miss this when you read it, uh, when he says um, in, in this letter that they should have joy. He says, uh, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again uh, and again. Several other times, Paul talks about being joy and having joy uh, in the Lord. Um, rejoice in the Lord always, verse 4 of chapter 4. I will say it again, rejoice. Um, so we can experience joy. This is one of the themes. Paul is in prison. He's suffering for the gospel, but he is full of joy. Um, it's almost like the two don't go hand in hand. But for Paul it did. Because when you know Christ and you know that you're suffering for his sake, then you can have joy in Christ. Then there are some of the dealings with false doctrines. Uh, there are enemies of the gospel who need to be exposed and opposed. And then there is um, um, much about the person of Jesus Christ. It is in Philippians that we find uh, that wonderful, uh, call it a hymn or a poem, in chapter 2, where he says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or to be held on to, but made himself nothing. He tells how Jesus became a servant and died, and therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, and that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Some of the passages that I want to encourage you to read, uh, chapter 1, verse 21, For me to live, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul's commitment to ministry, chapter 1, verse 21. Um, interesting passage where he talks about the possibility of dying and being with the Lord and yet staying and being with his people. Uh, after that uh, verse, in, in verse 21, he says, If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. Now, if Paul wrote this uh, when he was in Rome in prison, then it would be proof of the fact that he was expecting to be released and not to die, and that he probably, according to the early church tradition, that he was released, and then traveled some more, and only later uh, was executed. If he wrote this earlier, then um, again it would make a lot, a lot of sense. And I said earlier on that Paul may have written this from, uh, from Athens or, or Corinth. Uh, he probably wrote this, as we said, from Rome, when he was in prison uh, in Rome. I've referred to that Christological song or poem, and then uh, we've referred to the rejoicing, and then... Uh, chapter 4, verse 19. And you're talking about a man who didn't own much material by way of material possessions. Uh, 
But he does say in, in chapter 4 about the gifts that, that came to him. He says, not that I'm looking for a gift, in verse 17, I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I'm amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Takes us to the book of Colossians. Um, and really, in summary, we're talking about the person of Jesus Christ. Go back to the story of uh, Paul in uh, the city of Ephesus. And on this map, there is the city of Ephesus on, on the ocean, on the Mediterranean, uh, the city of Miletus over here, and then several of the other cities that we meet in the book of Revelation. Uh, Colossae, Laodicea, uh, Philadelphia is up there, Sardis uh, is, is up there, and Smyrna. Uh, you look at, at those, those are the seven churches in Asia Minor. Uh, Paul wrote letters to the church in Ephesus. He wrote one to Colossae. Um, and uh, this is the book that we have here, the book to the Colossians, or the church in Colossae. Colossae was a city, a, uh, not a major one, but a city in Asia Minor, near Laodicea, an ancient city of Phrygia on the Lysus, uh, which is a tributary of the Meander River. It was situated about 12 miles above or uh, south, in this particular case, of Laodicea and near the great road from Ephesus to the Euphrates. The site located in what is now Anatolia in Turkey has never been excavated. And so when you look at that particular area, this is a photograph taken from that area, and uh, this is the mound of Colossae that has never been uh, ex excavated. It's called the Tell of Colossae. The area where the city of Colossae was located was plagued by earthquakes, uh, as a result of which the city was destroyed a few times in history. It wasn't a big city or a major city at the time, but a mixture of backgrounds made the city uh, an interesting cultural mix of different people and a cultural center where people came from everywhere. And um, doctrines, ideas, philosophies were discussed at the city of Colossae. Here is a, a closer up of that tell of Colossae, as I said, never been excavated uh, as far as we know. The origin of the church in Colossae is, however, unknown to us. We are not told in the book of Acts, as, as opposed to Ephesians, Galatians, and several of the other uh, letters that Paul wrote, uh, we have no indication that Paul started this church himself. It may have been people who worked with him. In fact, we have uh, a, a, an idea that it may have been Epaphras, uh, and Paul talks about him when he says, as a part of the introduction, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. And then he goes on, all over the world this gospel is bearing fruit, um, and um, you've, you've heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. In verse 6, verse 7, you, heard, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is faithful, a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us about your love in the Spirit. So it, it seems to be a fairly clear indication that Epaphras was some kind of a link with, between the church and Paul. Now whether Epaphras planted the church as one of the co-workers of Paul, while Paul was perhaps in Ephesus during that two-year uh, stint of his uh, on his uh, second missionary or third missionary journey, uh, we, we're not sure. We know very little about uh, Epaphras. He's only mentioned in Colossians 1 verse 7, again in chapter 4 verse 12, and then also in the book of Philemon. This is one of the links between the, the Philemon a little letter later on, uh, which we will look at a couple of weeks from now, and the book of Colossians. There seems to be uh, some overlap between the two letters. Paul may have encouraged the planting of the church during his stay in Ephesus, as we saw before, when the gospel was preached in that whole region. In terms of the writing of Colossians, there is very little, in fact, almost no doubt that Paul is responsible for writing this letter. Along with Romans, Colossians was one of the two epistles written by Paul to churches that he did not plant. He's never met the church or the people there. Some of them may have been familiar to him. 
But as I said, we have no indication that he planted a church uh, similar to the situation we looked at last week with the church at Rome. Um, if Paul wrote this with the other prison letters, then he wrote it during the time when he was in prison in Rome in 62, 63, uh, perhaps A.D. The purpose of the letter, and here is a bigger picture with that whole region, as you now can see Philippi is over there. Um, from Philippi, we'll look at this next week, Paul traveled to Thessalonica, to Berea, and then all the way down to Corinth and Athens. Um, and, and on the other side, on the Asian side, the eastern side, uh, you have uh, Asia Minor with Colossi right there. The two spellings for the word Colossi, Colossae or Colossi, uh, either one is acceptable uh, according to the internet and, and the, the Bible dictionaries. Paul seems to have had a distant relationship with the church as well as the one in Laodicea. Now it's interesting, he says, I want you to know in, verse, in chapter 2 verse 1, how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. In other words, Paul makes it very clear that he has not met the church in Colossae as well as the church in Laodicea. Chapter 4 verse 16 um, he says, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. In other words, he's written the letter to Laodicea. We don't have a copy of that letter. Interesting question is whether we will add that letter to the canon if we do discover it, which I rather doubt at this late stage whether we will discover the letter. Um, my gut feel is, number one, we won't discover the letter, and even if we do, we may not add it to the New Testament canon, um, although it may come, and it will come from the, from the pen of the Apostle Paul, but that's another debate for another day, I guess. But whilst in prison, Paul received some information about churches in the Asia Minor region. That's the, that's the main area where Paul worked uh, as a missionary, and so it's not uncommon and, and unusual there for Paul, for Paul to receive some news, people coming and visiting Rome uh, and telling him about the churches in that area. He writes to encourage them and is also writing to counter the effect of false teachings. That uh, you almost see in every single letter. One of the reasons why Paul writes uh, is because of the false teachings that they have been exposed to. The exact identity of false teachings or the false teachers in the, in the city of Colossae and in the letter of, to, the, uh, to the Colossians, we, we're not sure about exactly what that was. Um, certainly the circumcision issue was there. Paul does address that. But there really seems to be other issues as well. And whether they all simply related to Judaism is, is doubtful because there are references that seem to refer to other kinds of of emphases as well. We can assume that it may not be one particular group, but actually a conglomeration of, or maybe several different kinds or, or streams of false teachings that came uh, their way. The first uh, century church, as we do today, have faced multitudes of different kinds of teachings, and we have seen that throughout church history, uh, where people have always gone on a on some kind of a tangent and believing stuff and then teaching other people that false doctrines arise, false churches uh, spring up. And, and it's not uncommon. It's happened in the first century. It happens still uh, till today. When it comes to the message of Colossians, uh, it, it helps us to bear in mind that there is a false teaching background to the book. Paul sought to ground the Christians in their faith. One of the things, the best ways to counter a false doctrine is to teach the truth. Rather than try and expose what is false, if you continue to tell people what the truth is, then they will believe the truth and they will be able to recognize whenever there is a false teaching coming their way. So in a certain sense, one can see that as Paul's approach over here. Very clear description of who Jesus is. Just listen to chapter 1 verse 15. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, 
so that in everything he might have the supremacy. You can't have a clearer statement about the person of Jesus than this. In fact, it's one of the highlights in the New Testament as far as, as we are concerned. And then Paul helps them understand where they have been coming from and where they are now. Once you were alienated, verse 21, from God, and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now, He, Jesus, has reconciled you, or God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. Being grounded in Christ, therefore, ensures the true faith of the Christians. With this knowledge and foundation, they would be able to withstand the many attacks that are going to come uh, their way. Some of the, uh, the contents as you go through the book, there's the opening, Paul, an apostle to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ in Colossae, grace and peace, that's the greeting. And then he goes on, he says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Uh, that's the thanksgiving and the intercession, the prayer for them. Uh, we've, we've read a bit of, of chapter 1, verse 15, the supremacy of Jesus Christ, uh, the impact of the gospel in their lives, uh, and that's all the way to, uh, um, to chapter 2, verse 5. And then Paul goes on to talk about the freedom. He says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted, built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thanks, thankfulness. Again, this strengthening and rooting them in Christ is the important thing in, in Colossians. Uh, helping them to understand who Christ is. And if they're rooted in Christ, they will not be uh, drawn into other false teachings as well. Uh, chapter, from chapter 2, verse 6 to 23, he talks about this freedom that we have in Christ. Just one other reference I want to point out, and that is in verse uh, 11. In Him, in Christ, you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by ha the hands of men, but by the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism and raised with Him through your faith in the power of God who raised Him from the dead. And so, again, there seems to be this niggling problem of the circumcision in the background. And now Paul is saying to them, you have, you have been circumcised, but it's a circumcision of the heart. You don't need a physical outward circumcision in order to be Christian. From chapter 3, further on it becomes far more practical. We actually see the sort of pattern in the, in the letters of Paul. The first, we call it the first half or the first section in the letter, is mostly theological, grounding them in the faith, explaining what the gospel is all about. The second part, the, the the, as, as he concludes the letters, he becomes a lot more practical. What, what are the implications of all of that? What is it, if I'm rooted in Christ, what does it mean for my daily living? And then oftentimes he would go into, like in Ephesians, here in Colossians, uh, he would go into practical day-to-day -day living. What does it mean for marriage? What does it mean for raising your children? Or if you're a slave, how do you serve your master? Etc., etc. Et so those are practical and ethical instructions. And he brings the letter to a conclusion with some greetings. Some of the passages that I want to encourage you to read um, is the one that I highlighted uh, in chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, the one I have not read is chapter 2, verse 9. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Again, very seldom you'll find a clearer statement about the person uh, and the nature of Jesus Christ, that is God. And then the defense against false doctrines in chapter 2, verses 6 to 12, a life focused on God. Um, chapter 3, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is your life, appears then you will also appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immor immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Again, it's very, very practical. How do you live your life? How, do you be, be, how, how you can be holy uh, and live a holy life uh, before God?
By way of conclusion, the four letters that we looked at tonight, Galatians is the grace versus law debate. We were set free to live by grace. And the encouragement is that we live by grace. We don't be, be drawn back into law. The human nature is to go back to law. We, we want rules. We want someone to tell us, do this, do that, and you'll be okay. The gospel is, we are free. We, we should serve God. And the law of Christ is the one that is the law that rules over us, not a physical law. Ephesians, we saved by grace. God saved us by His mercy so that we can live for Him. That's one of the key elements and teachings in the book of Ephesians. Philippians, joy. We have joy in Christ. Um, circumstances certainly don't take our joy, should not take our inner joy away. Uh, uh, inner joy is not just about being happy all the time. It means having a joy that no one can take away from Even when you are grieving, you can still have inner joy. And the book of Colossians, Christ is the full image of God, and being grounded in our faith is the best defense against false teachings. I want, to, I want to assure you that there are many, many false teachings around. I, I encounter them regularly uh, here in our city, in our country, um, and I see books and things coming and groups springing up all over the place where it's so easy to be drawn away. We have uh, members in our church here where um, they have grown up in a wonderful Christian home and one of the family members, not related to our church at all, um, the man has gone into a complete Hebrew movement. Uh, he had himself circumcised now. He no longer reads the New Testament. He no longer accepts that Jesus is the Messiah. He grew up in a Christian environment. And now he's a complete Hebrew. He's a Jew. Uh, and in that sense, he's rejected Jesus Christ. That happened, I mean, it's, it's happening as I'm speaking. And so it's not, a, it's not a foreign concept out there. So make sure as you read the scriptures that you make it part of your life and part of your belief. So that brings us to the end of tonight. Uh, read further. Read the Bible passages. I want to encourage you to read the Bible especially. And then look up the names and the concepts um, that you encounter. Next week we'll look at Thessalonians, two letters, and two letters to Timothy and one to Titus. Those five letters we'll deal with next week. So the Lord bless you, and I'll see you next time.